twofold really. I suppose it goes back to um, 1979 when I started working with my brother in, in Kew. He'd started like a parts business and that soon evolved into a shop. I uh, was selling guitars and, and then fitting the parts that he was sourcing or making to those guitars and very quickly he had more things to do than he could fit into one day so he called me up, I was a computer programmer at the time, I suddenly had the chance to you know, to work with guitars and get and get paid for it, paid for it, you know. Um, and it was a no-brainer really, you know. We, by that time I already loved guitars and it's, that's never really stopped. Soon the business kind of evolved into, um, I guess, me being responsible for the fixing stuff and him being responsible for making all the rest of it work, getting the parts in and that business kind of grew and grew and, and then in the, way, in the way of these things, um, he kind of had enough of it by, you know, 2000 and decided to get out in about 2003. By that time, it had been going for about 20 years and I figured that I quite liked to claw it back to how it was in the beginning when it was in a small shop and it was kind of much, seemingly much more intimate. And um, so <clears throat> I decided that I would leave that business and go and start my own, my own shop. So in 2003, uh, started Guitar Experience in Hampton Wick. Yeah, I think it's the, the repair thing that I really love doing. I always, you know, never really treat it like a job. It's always, you know, you're able to go and happily get paid for you know, indulging in your hobby. You know, it's just good. I think the key thing is with, I guess more or less any stringed instrument, if you just literally you can strum across the strings, don't even have to play a chord and just listen to it. If it sounds pleasing, it sounds kind of full-bodied, and doesn't make any, doesn't sound strangled, doesn't make any nasty noises that you wouldn't want to hear, then that's the start point. You know, you, I don't think you don't pass go until you get to that point. After that, you can consider a whole load of other things, but I think the initial thing is it's got to sound good acoustically, um, just with instantly. I think that's what you're looking for and I suppose for if you're buying an old guitar you need to think why you're buying it. Are you buying it as an investment or are you buying it because you think an old guitar is going to be better and you're going to play it um, because with as an investment you need to make sure that uh, what they call the provenance is good so that you know, you know as much as you can the history of it, that the condition is good and that the originality, the parts of the guitar are still either all there or mostly there. Uh, an example, if you like, is I've got a, a 1962 Stratocaster and on that, if you look at the bridge saddles and you look at the, the plate, the bridge plate, and look for where on the saddles and look for where where the mounting screws pass through the, the plate into the body. You know, it's hardly any. The metal is was so hard and of such a good quality. You know, it's not that absolutely as good as it was then, but it, it's not far off. Whereas now if you look at good stuff, you know, we do the Callahan stuff and, and he makes really good replicas of uh, a variety of Strat and Tele bridges and has kind of twists on them and his tunematic bridges are really good because they're really really well made much better than the stuff that uh, other people are turning out. Streamwinder is a really simple one but you know that saves us a lot of time because um, the number of sets of strings we have to change and it, it sounds bit of a cop-out answer in a way but I think that's the thing that loads of people don't have and to kind of expand upon it a bit really I think 
what we often have is guys who will be saying about ah oh, my guitars isn't staying tuned blah 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 <coughs> you know there must be something wrong with it well yeah sometimes there are things wrong with it the hardware can wear and that can cause can cause problems well when you start to kind of in, engage and dig a little bit deeper well how often do you play well you know i play probably i don't know four hours a day and you know seven days a week and at the weekend or maybe play six hours you know whatever and well how often do you change the strings well i change them about once a month you know well if you do that then you know, they're gonna they're definitely gonna break basically if you play that often now you can consider using the coated strings because they will last longer particularly if you have problems with sweat and stuff like that but even beyond that you know the thing that is a an overriding thing is that if you don't keep the guitar clean and wipe the strings down and they get khaki you know with kind of whatever you want to call it fingerboard mud of stuff hanging off the strings well the guitar's never going to sound any good it's, you can't really expect the intonation to ever be any good and so i guess my point is you know if you, if you keep it clean then it's going to serve you better the nut on the jack gets loose people do it up by hand finger tight and what that does, yeah, okay, probably the first time, second time, maybe it works okay. But the third time, all you're doing really is you, as you're twisting it on by hand, yeah, you're twisting the nut probably on a bit, but you're also twisting it internally, and eventually you just twist the wire off. You know? So all these things, little things, just keeping an eye on what's going on, particularly if you play a lot, you know. And I guess even if you don't, just make sure after a gig, after you play, just wipe the guitar down. And if you do all that, then you rule out those simple things in terms of if a problem ever arises. The guy who probably came in the most, you know, in terms of being a name guitar player was Gary Moore. You know, he would come and call a lot and play and astound people, I guess. But probably the funniest the funniest thing, and in a way the most memorable for a couple of reasons, was probably not long after we'd opened, we um, got contacted by um, Phil Taylor, who works for David Gilmore, and he put in touch with us the chap who is producing a record for Ringo Starr and uh, gave us kind of a shopping list of stuff that they wanted which um, was mainly amps, a couple of pedals but mainly amps including a couple of Vox amps and once we got the shopping list and said okay yeah we can do this you know we can do most of the stuff and then by this time we were dealing with the, the producer. And he said, okay, well, that's fine. He said, okay, well, I'll, I'll come in, you know, I'll come in at the weekend and just check out some of the stuff and then arrange for it to get, you can either bring it down or deliver it down to you know, the studio. So we said, yeah, fine, okay. So it was just a, I think it was summertime, pretty sure it was, it was spring or summertime. Anyway, about half past two, three in the afternoon, in comes uh, this American guy, multicolored beard. Turns out it's Ringo's producer. Then shortly after that, Ringo comes in the shop. So uh, at this point, there are probably, I don't know, there's probably two different groups of people in the shop. And um, they all kind of, you know, double take when they realize that, that you know, it's a Beatles kind of thing. And kind of I kind of speak with the producer and speak, speak a bit with Ringo. And uh, Ringo is fantastic because he actually spoke to a couple of the guys in the shop. You know, he said to one of the guys, Oh, you know, you guys in a band. And, and they said, Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, so, yeah, we do a Beatles song. And, and, uh, and he said, Oh, which one's that? And he said, Oh, it's Taxman. 
And Ringo said, well, I hope you get the drum, drum beat right, because loads of people get it wrong. And he kind of, you know, showed them what the drum pattern would be. And they were so chuffed. It was really good, you know. You wouldn't have imagined it, you know, it would have been such an engaging and pleasant experience, but it was really good with them. So that kind of sticks in my mind. So not really a guitar player, if you like, but a Beatle, which is pretty cool. I guess, you know, and we sold two Vox amps to a Beatle. That's pretty cool.